introduce myself. My name is Amadeo Papi. I'm national beam lead at GHD Vudat Creative Spaces based in, in New Zealand and part of the GHD Enterprise. And I will be the host of uh, these events. Um, please note that the events will be recorded and published on the Dynamo User Group New Zealand YouTube channel. And please note that the use of any information provided is the, in this presentation is at your own risk. Feel free uh, to scan and to use the QR codes across the introduction to open the relevant links. Uh, we will have also a QA session at the end of the presentation, so please write your questions in the QA panel. Um, okay, before we start, uh, le please let me introduce our group. Um, the Dynamo User Group New Zealand was founded mid 2018 by people coming from various AEC organizations. Currently, we have six co-organizers. Uh, we held B-monthly meetings. Uh, as you know, we publish our events on Eventbrite. Uh, depending on the event and on the circumstances, we host uh, in-presence and online events. The attendance is free, but registration on Eventbrite is always essential. Our online events are recorded and available on our YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe to the notify and to be notified when other events are published. As of today, our LinkedIn group counts uh, around 227 members. We had 167 registration to the event. So for all our new friends, please join and stay in touch with us. Today, we host Marcello Sgambelluri for a presentation on Rhino Inside Revit, Rhino, Revit, Grasshopper, and Dynamo working together. Marcello will guide, will guide us through uh, strategies, approaches, and workflows to leverage uh, Revit and Rhino's respective strengths through interoperability. Before introducing our uh, speaker, please let me uh, thank our virtual venue sponsor, Warren Maoni Architects, for providing us with access to their Zoom platform. So Marcello, Marcello Sgambelluri is Director of Advanced Technology at John A. Martin and Associates in Los Angeles. He has been presenting and training thousands of AEC professionals over his career at various conferences and training sessions for which he received prestigious awards, including several first place speaker awards at Autodesk University. He has worked in the AC industry for over 20 years as a structural engineer and beam director on various projects, including Walt Disney Concert Hall, the uh, Rayens and Maria's Tata Technology Center, and the Tom Bradley International Terminal Expansion. Marcello also recently published a book on Dynamo and Grasshopper for Revit, which is a clever, uh, comprehensive and I would say a very yeah very clever manual designed as a collection uh, of side-by-side -side dynamo and grasshopper examples uh, in one page summary format also referred as cheat sheets so I will leave the virtual stage to Marcello uh, thank you again for your contribution to our growing group and to the wider international community Hello, thank you. Mado, am I up? Yeah, I think you can I you can share your screen. I'm gonna stop share. All right. Uh let's see. Okay. Thank you for that excellent introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. Hello, everyone. How many people we got in here so far? We got oh, quite a few. Okay, excellent. Hello, and uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, I am in Los Angeles, so it is a little late, but it's all good. Show must go on. I appreciate you having me. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about Rhino Inside, Revit, Grasshopper, Dynamo, computational design, kind of all rolled up in one. What does it really mean in this world we're living in? Um, okay, if you have any questions, throw them out. Um, I don't know if you can turn on your mic and speak, but we'll have a question and answer session at the end, but feel free to ask a question. We'll monitor the chat. I don't mind being interrupted as I talk. Uh, no problem at all. Again, thank the thank your leadership group for for inviting me here. I really, really, really appreciate it. 
Uh, all right, so I do see some familiar names in the group here. Uh, that is awesome. All right, so let's let's get going. What do we got here? All right, so this is, <laughs> that's me. Uh, you gave me a great introduction, so I won't need to do much of it. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about some of the history of some of the things I've done in the past that it is related to computational design. Um, I do work at John Martin Associates, a structural firm in downtown Los Angeles. I've been there for 22 years, and um, I speak at AU and BUILT. And as Amato mentioned, uh, I have won first place speaker awards 17 times. Uh, that's because of the community, like like you folks, uh, supporting me so I can put out material and, and teach the world. Uh, so it's really more about you than me. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Um, so thank you. Thank you for letting me get the message across. Uh, all I want to do is just help the industry and, and, and make it better. I also run a podcast and a blog site called Simply Complex. There's my Twitter. Uh, I also do uh, training as well. If you want to contact me, just email me. Um, anything you see here, you could get uh, training uh, from me as well if you need it. So just contact me there. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. Nowadays, people don't even give you contact information, right? You just Google their name and, and away you go, right? So, um, okay. Uh, so let's get going. So I get about an hour. Is that right, Amato? And uh, Jasper, Monica, does that sound right? Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. We're good? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, normally uh, this is a little different for me and I'm, I'm still adjusting to this whole virtual situation we've been in because it's the world we live in right now. Uh, I'm usually up on the main stage in front of an audience. So, um, you know, I'll be, as I, as I talk, I'll be asking for, for audience feedback. So feel free to, to type in the chat as we, as we go along because uh, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what we need to do. Uh, okay, so uh, excellent. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Let's get into it. Um, computational design. Well, this is the Dynamo, right? This is the Dynamo New Zealand user group, but you're much more than that, right? I understand you're also into computational design as well as, uh, as, as, well as uh, API. So that's awesome. Uh, I kind of put that under the umbrella of computational design. So I thought I'd, I'd just kind of make sure I keep mentioning computational design. Uh, what I find, um, you know, I'm kind of a student of keeping my pulse on our industry, our AEC industry, on, on technology and what we're doing. And, and what I'm learning is we're in another shift of, of technology, like we were about 10 years ago when we were going from digital CAD tools to BIM. Now we're in another shift where we're going from BIM to computational design. Um, so I just, want, just wanted to mention to everybody that, that that's what I have been observing and that's kind of what I've been um, uh, uh, preaching the last uh, five or six years. So uh, if, you, if you're using Dynamo or Grasshopper and you think you know digital uh, computational design, um, just ask yourself and ask your company, are you really buying in 100% to this? Um, what we find is that uh, when I've talked to firms or friends I have in firms, they say, yeah, we're doing Dynamo, we're doing Grasshopper, we do dig computational design. But are you doing it? Is your little group doing it? Or is your company bought into it? And what I mean by that is think about how your company is bought into BIM, the concept of BIM. I'd imagine most of you are at this point, right? That means from the top all the way down, it's part of your work process, marketing, sales, whatever. It's all just part of your culture. Is computational design part of your culture? We're only little pockets doing it. So just kind of think about that. And you know, maybe you can be champions within your company to, to help promote this and help get buy-in. And you know, if you want to have offline conversations with me about how like how you might be able to do that, that's great. But just kind of think about where you are in your company and maybe how you could get total buy-in. And maybe you're already there. But I mean I, I'm just seeing I'm seeing this now with companies is that you know your your companies are starting to sink or swim with computational design. Either you've got full adoption or or you've got some adoption or you've got no adoption. And I think this is analogous to what happened with BIM 10 years ago. And, and why is this important? Because computational design is kind of built off your BIM tools. It makes you more efficient. I mean, everyone knows this, right? It makes you more efficient, automated, blah, blah, blah. But those are the conversations you kind of have to the, the folks running the company. Because this is, this is really important. Um, because, you know, we, I wouldn't want anyone here to get kind of left in the dust. So just as you just think about that, I wasn't really planning on originally talking about this, but as 
from the time Amado has invited me here, even over the last month, I've seen a lot of companies kind of dealing with this internally. Um, and and I, think, uh, I think it's important just to kind of think about it in a, in a, in a big view, you know, like where, where's your company? So I'd like to see all of your companies do this um, across the board. It'd be part of your culture because it really helps you. And this is what makes it possible, right? Programming. Now, visual programming for computational design is a big part of it. And Dynamo and Grasshopper, Rhino inside, everything we're going to talk about it is a big part of it. So I just thought I'd kind of get that out of the way so everyone understands. Are there any questions about that? Did, did anyone understand anything I said with my little soapbox rant there? Anyone want to type in the chat, hear what I'm saying? There's another shift. We're seeing this buy-in, cultural, want to be there. Anything? Let me see here. I see. Can I see everybody? A panelist and attendees. There we go. Okay. You like my previous slide. Oh, oh, oh the sinking and swimming? I, sorry, I, I couldn't see any of your comments because I was only looking at a private thing. You like this one? Is that what you're saying, uh, Maria? Okay, excellent. Uh, yeah, sounds good. Evolution, CAD, bin. There you go. Yeah, cool. Carrie, I love it. Keep the comments coming. Flow them in. We love it. Um, awesome. Yeah, okay. Good. So we got some people. Um, we got people on that. Okay, cool. Back to this. We'll get back to this again. Okay. I normally don't give talks like this, quite honestly. I'm usually like pick and click here and do this and that, you know, but but I thought I'd, you know, talk about this. Okay. Programming makes this all possible. But if you're not programmers, that's okay, right? Visual programming makes this possible, right? It makes you more efficient, automated, collaborative, and customized. That's what computational design does. If you want to borrow this slide or this one to talk to your folks at your office, whatever, that'd be awesome. Programming is a big part of it. And digital and, and visual programming like Dynamo and Grasshopper help you with that because it makes programming easy, right? Programming, a uh, big part of computational design. And then um, uh, visual programming made programming possible to the common AEC professional because it's just boxes and wires. It's no longer text. So it allows you to, to program. Um, and I mean, I wrote a whole book on it, more on that later, right? But that's that's kind of that's kind of what we're doing. All right. So the two big players in the game are Dynamo for Revit, right? This is a Dynamo user group. So awesome for you. Way ahead of the curve there. Um, you're definitely not sinking, you're swimming. Uh, so Dynamo is a big part of it, right? It's a visual programming language, talks with Revit. Revit's our, our production tool, right, for, for documentation. Um, and I like to call these boxes and wires. Autolist is early comp design. Sure, sure, I love that. I love that comment. Carrie's comment was, list, Autolist is early comp design. Sure, you could argue that. I, I think you could, certainly. If you can, if you can, if you can accomplish these things, more efficient, automated, collaborative, and being more customized through programming, then yes, I, I think you could, you could, which you could classify whatever that is as computational uh, design. I used to have this definition of computational design, but I took it off my slide because it's just this boring language that doesn't, you know, doesn't really translate to much. This translates to much, right? Being more efficient, more people kind of cling on to that. Okay, Dynamo for Revit, right? That's that's why we're part of this group. But another, whoa, man, another big one is, do I have the slide or did it get mixed up? Ah, yeah, yeah, I lost it. Okay, I had one on Grasshopper, but Grasshopper is another one. So Dynamo and Grasshopper, both visual programming language. Dynamo is visual programming for Revit, for the most part. Grasshopper is visual programming for Rhinoceros or Rhino, for the most part. Okay, um, cool. So um, let me tell you some of the stuff that I've done in the past. And I can tell you on the journey that I take to, to go to computational design. Um, I normally don't do this, but I thought it'd be fun. Um, so um, whenever I talk to user groups, you usually get a little more personal, um, if that's okay with everybody here. Um, okay, I'm just scanning the list here again. I do see some familiar faces, awesome, uh, familiar uh, names, awesome. If you're wondering, I'm at my home office in Los Angeles, in the Los Angeles area, and behind me is my lightsaber collection. So if you're looking, if you get bored and you want to look past me, then those are my lightsabers. Uh, and it's a bit nerdy to put those on the wall as my backdrop, but you know, hey, I'm okay with that. If so, 
Uh, maybe later on I'll light one of them up. How's that sound? Sound good? Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, the first BIM project I ever worked on was this one. And Amato, uh, when he gave me the intro, he, he mentioned this. This is the Walt Disney Concert Hall. Uh, Frank Geary, um, when I was a young structural engineer, um, we'd go to their office and, 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 and look at their tools that they were using. Uh, they were using two at the time, one called Rhino. They called it Rhinoceros back then. Uh, and another one was called Katia. Uh, that was my first experience with digital modeling tools, basically, uh, in 3D. Uh, so in this project, this is a project in downtown LA, um, that where the uh, LA Philharmonic is stationed. You know, you can see a lot of the twisted steel there. Uh, we had to basically model this entirely inside of uh, Katia and Rhino. Those digital models were actually given to the fabricators so they could they could all erect it up on up in place. Um, back then, we didn't have Revit and we didn't know the term BIM, but we certainly knew that we had to, to communicate this all digitally in 3D, or else there was no way we would be able to to uh, get this thing documented and constructed. Um, so this was this was kind of the early start of, of what I saw as computational. I mean, as as, uh, as BIM. Uh, and then uh, next project I worked on was this one, this status center at MIT, also Frank Geary Partners. Uh, same kind of process, you know, uh, more non-conventional shapes. I basically designed every piece of steel in this project as well as modeled it. Um, that was a lot of fun. And then, and then, uh, and then uh, Revit came along and I started using Revit. And then I started using my Katia and Rhino modeling skills to model things in, Rhino, in, in Revit that I didn't really see. And I thought, well, Revit doesn't have to be used for, for, just, um, for just buildings, right? Um, so I built um, some construction equipment and this is all in Revit. Uh, this is using the classic family editor. Uh, then I built this, this is an elephant I built in Revit. Um, just kind of pushing Revit to its limits. You know, how far could it go? Uh, did anyone ever see um, this? Um, Autodesk actually saw that when I built this and and uh, wanted me to tell them how I did it. <laughs> uh, and then I built, uh, you know, some more construction equipment, uh, classical Corinthian column, you know, this is all in Revit. Um, now, what does this have to do with anything? Uh, I just wanted to show you that um, some of these BIM tools that I've used early on, I did not use computational design. So these took me actually a lot longer than it would have if I would have used computational design and, and some other type of visual programming tool. Um, here's some trucks. Um, here's a cow in Revit still all done manually uh, inside of Revit. Airplanes, uh, this pumpkin that morphs into a can of pumpkins. <laughs> kind of fun, it was a pumpkin modeling contest. Uh, human head, uh, this is topography. Does anyone like topography, modeling topography in Revit? Gotta get you involved. A yes or a no if you like topography. A yes if you like it or a no if you don't like it. Yes, Carrie, you like modeling topography in Revit? Okay, anyone else? Topo and Revit. Yes, you love Topo. Okay. Finally, <laughs> Topo. Okay. <laughs> you normally, I don't get a bunch of yeses. I usually get a bunch of noes. Uh, <laughs> okay, Robin, there you go. Don't like modeling and, and topography. Um, it, could be, it could be challenging. Um, here's some of the things I've modeled with topography just to prove that you can do complex shapes. Like there's a dolphin jumping out of water. There's another human head. Um, here's actually a Batmobile that I did. <laughs> Uh, I was in the freeway in Los Angeles and, a, and the Batmobile from the original uh, movie, uh, Tim Burton movie, drove past me on the freeway and I was encouraged and I thought, ah, I'll build that with topography. Um, okay, and then, um, you know, roof crickets. So anyway, the point is, is that I was building all of this not using uh, any computational design or visual programming. Uh, and I thought at the time when I finally got to the end of when I was doing this, this was 2013. And I thought, you know, I don't, I heard of something called Dynamo and Revit and visual programming. And I thought Dynamo is just to model complex shapes. There's no way I need that because I can pretty much model anything I want in Revit. Right? And what I'm getting at is this was kind of the worst attitude I could have ever had. Because at the time I was thinking, I don't need visual programming, right? But what opened my eyes was even though even though I could model like all this stuff inside of Revit, whenever I would go and I would build sheets or I would change parameters, right? I would just be manually doing it, right? 
So you could build a roof cricket like this, like a bug cricket or a chirp chirp cricket, right? On a roof in Revit, right? But if you wanna make sheets, you still have to manually place sheets one by one or copy them one by one, right? And I thought, you know what? There's gotta be a better way to do this. Maybe I'll look at Dynamo. And that's when I started looking at Dynamo and it really opened my eyes. And so from that point on, this was 2014, I even talked to class at Oxford University. I really got into Dynamo for Revit and I realized it's much more powerful than just modeling complex shapes. Uh, now, you probably all know this, I'm just kind of telling you the journey I went on and the mentality I had, which was, um, I learned a valuable lesson, which was I would never take any software I'm using for granted. I would always look out and see what other tools I can use to, to help me. And so Dynamo is just none. The new one on the block is Rhino inside Revit. And we'll get it on a bit, but um, Dynamo for Revit, of course, um, can really help you even with documentation, uh, right? This, uh, here's one example I showed in, in Revit Autodesk 2014 at one of my classes. I've, since then, I've taught tens of thousands of people Dynamo. I've helped the community learn and grow uh, through Dynamo and how my attitude changed. So, so I'm actually uh, very proud of that because I, I'm in a, uh, at that point, I was in a different place and I, I never looked back. So I had that in my mind. I could automate, and that was one very important thing to do with computational design was automating, right? You could be, you could model an elephant or a cow in Revit, but if you can't automate using programming, then you are seriously hurting yourself because you could definitely be more efficient. So that taught me a major lesson. I can make me automated. Um, at that point in time, I pivoted and I said, I'm going to use I'm going to use computational design every time I do any project or model anything in Revit from now on. So this is a project I did at Cal Poly Pomona with co-architects. That's a university in Southern California. Uh, more complex shapes. We use Rhino. Um, that's the finished product on the bottom. Uh, this is looking up under the roofs uh, from, from Rhino all the way to fabrication um, using, uh, using um, uh, this used Dynamo and Grasshopper and Rhino all together. Uh, here's a project I did LAX. I modeled all the structural steel using Dynamo, little detailed hat channels. It's really saved me a lot of time. There's San Diego Airport, bottom left. Uh, so anyways, these are just some examples of, of how my life changed when I adapted uh, visual programming uh, into my life. I modeled this, the Revit goat. Someone wanted a goat uh, in Revit. I said, I'll do it. And so I actually modeled the goat in Revit. Uh, there bottom right is some Dynamo scripts to help kind of rationalize the surface. I no longer had to do it. Uh, it's in, in manually, it saved like so much time. Cheat sheets are great. Having compared Dynamo Grasshopper cheat sheets more than great. Oh, yes, thank you for that comment. Uh, these cheat sheets are a saver for me. Oh, great. Okay, we're already jumping to the book. That's awesome. Yep. All comments, welcome. Chat amongst yourselves. I love it. Um, yep, this is awesome. <laughs> we'll get to the book. <laughs> we're talking about the book. Get to the book. But yes, just kind of telling you, uh, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but uh, just telling you this is just the journey I took uh, on this. So here's the goat help dynamo. This is the latest one I built. Uh, this is a rhinoceros in Revit uh, that I modeled using, using dynamo. There it is. Uh, later I'll show you this. We can actually bring it into the rhino program, but I thought modeling a rhino in Revit would be fun. So there it is. Um, also, I modeled a, uh, a retired ocean liner that sits in Long Beach, California. It's called the Queen Mary. I used uh, Dynamo to help kind of rationalize all the surfaces. That's actually the structural steel there as well. Um, that was a lot of fun. So anyway, I'm just giving you examples of how I use Dynamo and Grasshopper in my, in my life, and it changed my life. Um, so I guess the lesson here is even if you think, or someone in your company, might not be you, even if you, someone in your company thinks they're the best at the software they're using, they could have a cape and they could be a champion. You know what I mean? A superhero with a cape, you know, Revit superhero, right? If they're not using computational design and visual programming, then they are not being as efficient as they could be. All right. Okay, <laughs> good, getting more comments. Yes, the GOAT was done with visual programming. Yes, that's right, <laughs> it sure was. <laughs> the secret's out. Yeah, you see all this, uh, see all this uh, rationalization? This was all done using, um, using uh, 
using Dynamo. Yep, and uh, this is one solid sweep from the back leg all the way to the front, all the way to the tip of the nose. It's just one sweep. Okay, the trick there is to make continuous profiles if you wanna know. So if you're modeling an organic shape or maybe some complicated facade, if you want it to loft in Revit, then just make nice, easy transitions. That's the secret. Uh, Maria, what's the honest comment? Um, even if you think you're a superstar that, and you're not, even if you think you're the best user of that software on the planet, I've got a comment on here, Maria. Maybe you can clarify for us, Maria. Are you saying, oh, okay, yes. Maria's saying yes. If you think you're the best software user on the planet and you're not using some type of computational design, let's talk about AEC, then you're selling yourself short. Um, yes, I totally agree with that. Yes, so Maria, thank you. Because lots of people think they can just do what they do faster. Yeah, very good. This is this is good. But that's not the point than others, yes. Thank you, Maria, for that. I, I appreciate that. Yes, yes, uh, that's, that's the whole reason I'm mentioning this. And that's why I kind of went through my backstory, right? And I mean, I didn't think I was the best Revit modeler on the planet. You know what? Autodesk told me I was the best modeler, Revit modeler on the planet at the time. Uh, and then, you know, and, and, and so, you know, I don't like to think of myself that way. But anyway, I'm just saying that I don't think I'm the best Revit modeler on the planet, by the way. Just official YouTubers that are listening later, I don't feel that way. But yes, if you, if you are the kind of individual who think you know everything about a software and you're not using computational design, then if you did, you would be even better. So that's the idea. Okay, oh, right, right, right. Yeah, you know what I like to think of that, Maria, is have you ever heard that saying um, they told Ford when he was inventing the car, all we need is faster horses? Have anyone heard that? You know, I, I've heard that. I never looked it up if that's really true, but I heard that and it makes a lot of sense, right? You're thinking kind of in one direction, right? You got to think outside the box. What can help you? Literally outside the box, right? With visual programming. Okay, and then, uh, you know, some fun stuff, right? Uh, did this locker. Uh, computational design really helped me lay out a lot of this stuff. Uh, okay, always something to learn. Yes, Carrie, always something to learn. Yes, if you're always willing to learn, then you are in very good shape. So if we're all willing to learn, that's awesome, because the next thing is computational design. Yay. Uh, okay, so it makes you more collaborative. Oh, there's my there's my grasshopper slide. I guess I guess it makes sense to be here. Uh, okay, so um, I'm touching my screen and you can't see me. Normally I'm used to being on stage and touching the screen. Okay, so grasshopper for Rhino. Uh, this is Rhino's visual programming language. It's been around a little longer. Uh, it's boxes and wires as well, um, although I, it's much more than that. But but in in its core, at its at its core. That's how information is passed through the wires and the and the boxes, which are called um, nodes and Dynamo components and Grasshopper uh, is what actually does the work or the functions. Um, this particular example basically takes uh, some information and, and, and kicks it out to Excel um, using Grasshopper. Certainly could do that with Dynamo. Um, OK, so now we talked about how to be more efficient, right? You could be you could I mean, how to be more automated. You can use Dynamo or you can use Grasshopper to help you, like the way I like rationalize the curves or built a structure with the inside the ship and the Queen Mary, whatever. It, you can be more automated with it. You want to make multiple sheets. You can also be more collaborative. And this is this is kind of the new thing. And this is where we'll get into the weeds of this is how do we be more collaborative? Computational design allows you to be more collaborative, work across multiple platforms. Right. So in the industry, everyone help me out. Right. Isn't this a current problem? Maybe we can get some feedback here. Um, it, is anyone using? Um, let me back up and then I'll ask the question. OK, uh, typically in AEC industry is uh, firms. Let's talk about design firms. Design firms will do a lot of their uh, design and early design and early modeling in a 3D modeling software. And then later on, they will do their documentation in Revit. So one of those modeling environments is Rhinoceros or Rhino. Okay, that's kind of typically how a lot, not all, but a lot of design firms work. Architecture firms, AE firms, 
Um, does anyone want to chime in? Is that how it is in your office? Is rhinoceros is being used for modeling and Revit is being used for documentation? Or, okay, chime in. It could be another one. It could be 3D Studio Max, Form Z, um, SketchUp, Rhinoceros, uh, OrCAD, 3D AutoCAD, uh, SketchUp. I hear, I hear worse. Someone says worse SketchUp. Uh, Rhino to model. Blender. Ooh, Mark. I like Blender. That's Mark Perry. Mark Perry coming all the way from the Bay Area in uh, California. If that's the right Mark Perry. Excellent. Welcome, Mark. Um, there are different speeds. Switch to Revit is very easy. Facade usually stays in Rhino a little bit longer. Okay, some comments here. Fusion 360, uh, Revit, SketchUp, and 3D Studio. Okay, cool. So, so I'm seeing a trend here um, that not all, but a lot, of firms use 3D modeling software that is not Revit to do their designs, and then they need to get it into Revit, right? Um, looking forward to Hypar. Okay, yep, good. Hypar is computational design falling into that generative design area, which is which is an exciting area. Uh, Amato and Jasper and Monica, you know, maybe one day um, you can invite me back and we could talk about generative design. That's a whole nother topic uh, for another time, but yes, that would be, that that's that's certainly um, part of this whole equation and 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 um, paradigm shift that we're seeing as well. Okay, cool. This is awesome. You got a you got a lively group here. I love it. Um, oh, we gotta we gotta we gotta. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm a little new to managing this Zoom. We've got a Q and A panel and we've got a chat panel. I just opened the Q&A panel so I can see both now so you can put in either one. So no problem, we'll, we'll manage this. Did you know uh, my last class I taught at Autodesk University, uh, it was live like this and I had, uh, I had, um, I had 1200 people in that session and, uh, <laughs> and they were asking questions and the thing was scrolling like this. Uh, when I looked back at it, I had 900 questions and comments. So uh, no problem, please feel free to ask as much as you want. We'll take you up on the offer. Okay, awesome, Jasper. Okay, so some comments there, but I, I'm learning from what I'm hearing and the research that I've done in the industry and you know all that is that this is, this is a common thing. Uh, let's focus on the new tech, which is deals with making yourselves more um, collaborative, meaning going from one software to another. Let's now focus for a little while on a new kid on the block called Rhino Inside Revit. So let's just talk about if you use Rhinoceros. Now, if you don't use Rhino or Rhinoceros, this talk is still a good thing for you to listen to because you know you may you may start to think about it. Uh, okay. Uh, Mark Perry, I don't get your comment. You have a ton. You have a ton. Um, ton of comments. I don't know. Uh, okay, so uh, wow, we got a good group today. Excellent, Mara. We got over fifty people in here. Holy moly! Okay, awesome. Okay, so where was I? <laughs> so, uh, so let's talk about Rhino. Now, what's the problem? Let's just focus on Rhino for now. But later, let's talk about other software like SketchUp, FormZ, 3D Studio Max, 3D AutoCAD. Uh, starting to use Rhino Seven in Revit. Carry good comment there. Okay, what's the problem right now in our industry is this, right? How do you get from how do you get from your design software to your your um, to your BIM software? BIM software. Let's just focus on Revit, um, right? That's very good at collaboration as well as documentation, right? So you need to get it there, uh, and of course you can go the other way. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, but what? <laughs> I want everyone, I want people to feedback on this too. What is the current workflow that, that, that goes on? Um, I've seen this and I've personally done this, uh, basically remodeling from scratch is one option. It's one option, right? To get it, to get your 3D design models into Revit is to model from scratch. I mean, everyone agrees with that. That is one option, of course, right? Could anyone chime in? Is this what anybody does? Uh, or has done in the past. I'm guilty of it. Taking AutoCAD into Revit manually. 
Yeah, I think what you're getting at, uh, uh, Noam, Noam, is it? Is, uh, is that um, you probably do some kind of import, right? That's another option. So, an op so options for interoperability in our, in our current workflow in our industry right now is remodeling from scratch. A link a lot of file formats and proxy object between applications, trying using Rhino package a couple times. Monica, thank you uh, for that. Okay. Yes, you're, you're, everyone's jumping ahead, which is awesome. Uh, so remodeling from scratch, no one wants to admit it. Okay, I'll admit it. I've done it. No one wants to admit it. That's fine. Um, we already went over this. Uh, link AutoCAD. Okay, Carrie. So linking AutoCAD or some kind of import, right? Some kind of import, maybe an SAT, maybe a DWG right, into Revit. I do remodel in Revit. Richard, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just, uh, you know, it's, it's one way to do it. <laughs> uh, very good. Uh, you're not alone, Richard. I've done it. So, uh, okay. So uh, import, I hear that too. Uh, and then, and then also, uh, Link IFC, good one. Yeah, so these are imports, you know. Um, I could put a bunch here, IFC, right? Whatever import is, right? Whatever whatever that may be. Um, and then uh, over here we have like an add, like like using an add-in. So, so uh, I heard earlier Rhinomo, let's see who said that. Uh, who said Rhinomo? So uh, was that you, Carrie? Someone said Rhinomo, I can't, I can't scroll up there. Um, okay, so, uh, Emiliano said, uh, me, uh, speckle, rhino, hummingbird, good. I'd link rather than import where I can, sure. This can say link slash import, yeah. Okay, so uh, also Rhinomo, um, uh, conveyor, um, yeah, hummingbird, uh, mantis shrimp. Uh, you know, there's a lot of add-ins out there that can take your 3D design models into Revit as an add-in, quote unquote, okay? So these are kind of the three things you can do in our industry, right? Now they all have ups and downs, right? Don't they? Um, what do we got here? Import CAD to Revit, also put MEP connectors to the model, sometimes need to remodel. Okay, yeah, I'd rather link them. Okay, cool, yes. Here, um, Mario and Jasper and Monica, you know, you've got a great group here. Thank you for inviting me. Everyone's nice and lively. I love it. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Uh, I love everyone uh, commenting here. This is good stuff. I appreciate everyone, uh, everyone's feedback. Keep throwing it out. Uh, okay, so um, uh, what I want to get at here is, uh, is that um, these are all kind of ways to do it, right? Um, there's a new tech on the block that if we're just focusing on rhinoceros right now, rhino, rhinoceros, there's a new tech on the block and it's called Rhino Inside Revit, right? <laughs> that was supposed to, you know, be it. I gave it away already, but that's Rhino Inside Revit. That's what that's supposed to be. Okay, Rhino Inside Revit, what'd they do? The big nail folks who did rhinoceros, who makes rhinoceros and, and grasshopper said, you know what, in order to solve this interoperability issue, Let's just take the entire rhinoceros program and grasshopper program and stick it inside Revit and make it like an elaborate add-in. That way you have all the access within Revit to use Rhino, Rhino's geometry, grasshopper, uh, and you can move information back and forth in a very quote unquote meaningful way. Point is to transfer it one time thing. Sometimes weight on ad hoc script is bigger than modeling by hand, of course, is never just one time. No, it's never just one time, right? And, and you bring up a good point. Um, I digress a lot when I talk because I, I like to, in the user group, I'm a little more informal, um, is yes, imports kind of seem like one directional and they only seem like one time. Of course, remodeling from scratch is definitely a one-time thing. Uh, Add-ins usually are just a one-time thing, but, but what happens when there's dynamic changes? What happens if you change the rhinoceros model halfway down the life of the Revit model, right? What type of information is coming in? Is it meaningful? And that is what hit me in my heartstrings when I looked at this tech, is that you can take rhinoceros information and bring it into Revit in a meaningful way. And what do I mean by meaningful? A lot of times when we do imports, right, they become what, unintelligent SATs. And what do I mean by unintelligent? Uh, it's difficult to, to, to tag to it, to dimension to it, 
to put a section through it, to, to do renderings on it, uh, that sort of thing, right? It's very limiting. Uh, you don't have the ability to modify it later if you, if you it, it just within Revit alone, because it's like an unintelligent quote unquote blob. Everyone kind of with me. So, so, so when I mean meaningful, I mean meaningful. I don't mean bringing it in and, because if you brought it in and it wasn't meaningful, like you couldn't dimension to it, you couldn't do your documentation with it, then what's the point, right? About establishing a repeatable project workflow. Yes, Carrie, you need to establish a repeating meta workflow. So let me show you what this new tech does, okay? Uh, Rhino inside Revit, I'll give you this example. Okay, let's say we have, in fact, I'll even pull up an example. Uh, okay, so let, let me open up my model here. Uh, okay, so this is, this is uh, Revit. Oh, oh, here's Revit, where's Revit? Okay, here's Revit, right? It's a blank Revit model, all right? So the new tech actually lives here under your, under add-ins, you would click this Rhino 7 and then you would get a new Rhinoceros tab. Okay, Rhinos, Rhino is short for Rhinoceros. So I typically call it Rhinoceros, not Rhino, because now I use Rhino and Revit in the same sentence and sometimes I switch them. <laughs> so I try to say Rhinoceros. Uh, okay, and then um, all, you need, a, you need a, a license Rhino 7 in order for this to work. You need a license of Rhino 7, or you can get a demo if you want to try it. Um, it also is available to you uh, if you just want to try this tech out. Uh, it comes here. Now you'll have this tab called Rhinoceros within Revit. Um, it works on 2020, 2020, 2021. It works all the way down to 2018. Uh, 2022, I don't know yet. Uh, I know that'll be out very soon. So that I, I can't answer at the moment. Um, okay. And then uh, you'll get these tabs here, Rhino and Grasshopper. You can fire up Rhino, and that would be considered Rhino Insight. So I fired that up and opened this Rhino model. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so let's look at this project. This is a Rhino model. This is Rhinoceros environment, okay? Uh, if you're not familiar with Rhino, it's a 3D modeling program, very accurate, really, really friendly modeling environment. Uh, this would be, let's say there's a project, I just made this up, but let's say there's some type of topography here. And then there's like, uh, like a speed ramp. And this is like parking. And this is like a little shack for, I don't know, buying tickets or a restroom or something. And there's another walking path up here and then another platform and a little lookout tower. Okay, so I kind of built this, but you know, in rhino, in rhinoceros, but let's just say this is how your design ended up. Um, so how do you bring this meaningful, inf this information into Revit, right? Uh, well, uh, let's just look at the topography first, and then we could examine other things, okay? Does it work with any version of Revit? Uh, Monica, um, good question. I think I said that. Uh, as far as I know, it works from 2018 up to 2021. Does it work with any version? You answered that. I answered it. Okay, cool. Uh, all right. Uh, cool. Okay. Uh, about a style. Okay. Okay. So what do we do? Uh, all right, so let's say we want to do this. Well, uh, you're, you're, if you're in Rhinoceros, you're going to probably be modeling this as a grep or a, a um, some kind of poly surface, right? Um, and then what you can do is you, is you activate, this is Rhino inside Revit. If you notice, no Rhino tab is open down here because it's running within Revit. Uh, and then um, you can open up Grasshopper either from here or from the Revit tab right here. And then uh, it'll open up Grasshopper. I already have it open, okay? Now, uh, let me show you what these do. Uh, this, is, this is Grasshopper, if you're not familiar with it. It's, it's visual programming, um, but Grasshopper, and I'll point you back to here where we're going. Grasshopper becomes the conduit to get your Rhino geometry into Revit in a meaningful way. So in this case, we're just doing topography, but we can go over others in a little bit. Okay. So everyone clear with that? So this is what it looks like. Okay. So remember we got a blank Revit file, I mean, sort of blank Revit file. You saw it, right? Okay. All right. So then basically grasshopper, uh, what you do here is uh, you basically, this basically, this is a brep, uh, which is a generic surface in Rhino. So you basically select it out of rhinoceros. Uh, and then you basically, uh, you add some points to it, do some list management. And then this is the magic one right here. This one creates a topo Revit element from the grasshopper points. Okay, because the points are built in Grasshopper, but the surface comes from Rhino. Okay, and then if I activate this and I hit enable, uh, it's just going to chew for a second. And then it's going to actually build topography inside of Revit. 
Now, this is the topography in Revit, okay? Looks just like the shape that was in Rhinoceros, right? But do you notice that what this is? This is a topography element. I could edit the surface and I could look at the points. These are the points that were built from the points we put inside of Grasshopper. So you see here? So this is actually a native Revit topography element, okay? So this was actually built and controlled by Grasshopper that was, con that was built off of geometry and rhinoceros. So, uh, Carrie, if you wanted to, and others, <laughs> if you wanted to modify your rhinoceros file for whatever reason, wherever it's at here, right, you can modify this. And since Grasshopper is constantly running, then it would automatically modify the topo surface in Revit and make it and, and make the adjustment. Okay, so you could you could have this topo surface heading down the assembly line, you could be tagging it, putting entourage on it or whatever. But if your if your rhinoceros design changed, then this would automatically change because it's all being controlled by by grasshopper components that have built this. Is that clear to everyone? Because I always get that that kind of question, what happens if it changes? And it doesn't have to be just for topography. So there's a lot I kind of went over. One, you can take you can take rhinoceros geometry into Revit in a meaningful way, meaning that this is Revit topography. It is not an unintelligent SAT import. I am not a Rhino user. Can this be can this be geo coordinated? Uh, yes, it could be geo coordinated. Uh, in fact, uh, they are geo coordinated. Yes. Uh, between right between rhinoceros and gra between yes between rhinoceros and and grasshopper uh, that's what sets up the geolocation for where it goes into uh, into um, into Revit. <laughs> Instead of getting into the weeds, because we can get into the weeds, but I'm just showing you that this is just one solid example. So Rhino builds rebuilds the Revit elements. Yes, who said that, Carrie? Yes. It does rebuild the Revit element, but this is only this is only one way to get meaningful geometry from Rhino to Revit. I know we're getting in the weeds, but let me just keep moving on. But yes, you you have it. Yes, yes, it does. Now, does that mean that the geometry was imported? No, but it means that all the geometry in Rhinoceros, all the geometry in Revit, is being controlled by Rhinoceros. So. Um, that's, that's one way to look at it. Uh, okay, so let's keep moving uh, on. So uh, so any questions there? D done by Rhino remote control. That's a good way to think of it. Uh, do we need to split larger topo to reduce conversion time? Oof, these are some serious in the weeds questions. Um, <laughs> woof. Uh, well, okay, the question was, do you have to split it up? Wow, I like these questions because that means uh, you hear this, Jasper, Monica? We're, Monica, we're like in the weeds here with questions. That's awesome. I love it. Um, <laughs> let's save that for the end. Uh, the question was if this gets really big. Let's save that for the end. Uh, for the most part, no. Um, but you know, I, I I I go back to this all the time. You know, like how long does it take to to build meaningful geometry from Rhino? Well, I can tell you one thing right now. I will guarantee you it'll be way faster than remodeling from scratch or an import that you have to then model over. So, you know, think about it, kind of think about it that way. <laughs> you know, like, can you save a few seconds by dividing it up? You know, I don't know, I, that would be up to you to decide. Okay, uh, just wanna tell you what Rhino Insight is not. Do I think it's the best thing since sliced bread? Absolutely. Will it save you time? Absolutely. Will it make you automate it? Absolutely. It, it, it solves a lot of the interoperability issues that we're having and it's still computational design which is awesome um that's not the best slide to show this one it's just think of rhino inside revit as like a piece of gold you kind of mold it into your workflow in your office so so the question was and i think that came from from marlin there right like well do we split the surface up well i don't know that would be something that you decide you know do you do you uh do you model <laughs> Do you uh, do you model do you model this on a, on the to do you do you make a topo layer in rhinoceros uh, and model on that? Well, that would be up to you. You know, do you do you uh, do you assign a material here? You know, do you change the color here? 
you know, like, like these are all things that you decide, right? It's, you have to decide these things for yourself. Um, that's why, that's why it's very workflow oriented. So um, a lot of these questions that I get, should I do this, should I do that? Well, it really depends. You know, I mean, we could have, if I was there in New Zealand, uh, you know, and I was there in person, you know, we would, after the, after we could have these academic discussions, uh, you know, but, um, but anyway, okay. So this was just topo, right? So I gave you a little glimpse of how to bring geometry in. There are other methods. So just think about this as a piece of gold. That's the way I like to think of it. Okay. I like to think of, you know what? I like to think of new things in AEC, like little, little nuggets of gold or like little presents. I like to think of them as presents, you know? Um, just you gotta have the right attitude about it, right? Like Rhino inside Revit, is it perfect? No, but is it gonna help you? Oh yes, right? So I think about it that way. Um, you know, you kind of think about it, if someone gave you a present, right? And it was, it had a pink bow on it and you're like, oh, well, I don't like pink bows, right? And they're gonna say, well, let me take the present back. You won't appreciate it, right? You know, I wanted a blue bow, you know, okay, I'll take it back, right? So I just kind of think of these as like little gifts, little presents, and then, you know, my, that's where my mind is anytime I see this. And then anything, and then my expectations are, if there's issues, then I'm like, okay, well, there's things that, um, you know, things aren't perfect, but at least it helps me here in that area. So it's really, over the last 22 years I've been working in this industry, it's really about attitude and having the right attitude as you hit a new tool. Um, or as you talk to your coworkers <laughs> or the industry, quite honestly. Okay, so uh, so let me, let me. Um, okay, I showed the model, cool, cool, cool. Okay, here we go. So um, collaboration and interoperability is a big thing. So um, I have on the book that I wrote, um, and we'll get into a little later, is it's called the Dynamo and Grasshopper for Revit Cheat Sheet Reference Manual. Uh, there is, um, there's tabs on the side that actually show you, you know, different sections. Does this one have, yeah, this one has it. Uh, it's hard to kind of see, uh, but there is one whole chapter on interoperability, how to get geometry from one place to another using Rhino inside Revit. And these are very important questions you have to ask yourself. Okay, so uh, attitude is king. Yes, attitude is king. Uh, okay, so um, uh, let me show you, these are four main methods to get geometry, meaningful geometry from Rhino to Revit. One we went already went over, which is this one on the bottom right. You basically build native Revit elements. And I think someone summed it up really well. Uh, the, you basically said, uh, where is it? Uh, Rhino builds, rebuilds, let's see, where was it at? Done by Rhino remote control, done by Rhino remote control. Yeah, I guess that's kind of what this is, right? So, so we basically built this topography from Rhinoceros into Revit into a native Revit element. Now, what's nice about that is if you do choose to use that way, then when it becomes topo in Revit, where's my Revit? Here, right? Oh, let me see. Right here, right? You could sever the link with Rhino if you wanted to. You don't have to, right? But this becomes a native Revit element. So you can modify it um, if you wanted to. Uh, you know, once you separated it from, from, from rhinoceros, and we can talk about how to do that. But that's the nice thing about native Revit geometry, because, because it's native Revit geometry. You know, Revit knows how to deal with it, and so do you, because uh, you've been modeling in Revit for so long. Uh, so that's one major advantage there. Uh, another way to do it is to, uh, what I call, bring it in kind of a quick way, is to use um, a, a something called a direct shape. It'll bring the geometry in, but just as like a generic model category. Another way you can do it is you can bring geometry in, but you can assign a material to it um, as well as a category. Uh, another way to do it, uh, and I use all four of these methods. Another way to do it is you can actually take geometry and you can stick it in a Revit family template. Like let's say you built out, uh, remember that Corinthian column? If you built out that Corinthian column, if it was in rhinoceros, you could then stick it into a structural column template, family template, and then load that family template. So it'll actually build, Rhino inside Revit will build a family for you in the template of your choice and place it, geolocate it in a location of your choice inside of Revit. So, uh, excuse me, inside of, yeah, inside of Revit. So these are kind of the four methods that you can use, uh, if that helps, helps you kind of understand this. Uh, 
Uh, let me see here. I got to get my chat window back up. I lost my chat window. Why did I lose my chat window? Hang on a second. Uh, let's see the chat. There we go. Okay. So, um, okay. So I got a question here. Will Rhino inside Revit be more compatible with Revit in the future? I tried something, one project ended up some geometry, not as native. Okay. Uh, well, um, let's see uh, that. Uh, okay. So that comment comes that uh, so some of you have already tried this tech and it, and some of it doesn't work for you, um, which is understandable. It's not perfect. It's certainly a lot better than remodeling from scratch. Um, one thing I, let me, there's a, there's a lot to unpack in that question. Uh, is that Zhao or Zai? Zai? Uh, uh, there's a there's a lot to unpack with that question. Um, uh, one is that this is a very new tech. Uh, anyone who's using it or experimenting with it is way ahead of a lot of people in the industry. Uh, so this is new. Uh, it's really early on tech. So there are going to be issues. Uh, also, Rhino inside Revit, the actual add-in that sits here, is actually still in beta. So there are improvements happening all the time. Um, and so, um, if you've had issues in the past, I would recommend you try it again. Um, and, uh, you know, what's funny, uh, if you have an issue with building, using beta versions in AEC software, well, I mean, don't we use, I look at it this way. I don't have a, I used to have a problem with it, but I don't anymore because don't we use beta versions all the time in AEC? I, I like to think of schematic drawings as beta versions, right? Cause they constantly change and evolve. So. If you're comfortable using beta versions, schematic drawings, those are like beta versions, right? Or even development design drawings or early phase drawings. Uh, you know, so they kind of change throughout the life. And, and this software is so new that, that there are things changing all the time. Uh, you have to, you have to, curious that to play with it, uh, pronounce as C. Okay, okay, this counts as C. Okay, C, C shout. Did I get it right now? C shout, that's it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, so that's just kind of my that's just kind of my general comment on on that. Um, it's constantly on the time. It's in beta, so you know, think about it that way. Can it help you? Absolutely. Uh, and you know what? I, I think about it this way. Um, if if for example, I'm just throwing that as, as 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 a for instance. If for example, you were able to get topography to work perfectly, uh, walls. We'll get into that. Floors. Uh, beams, columns, but your ramps didn't work. I don't know. I'm just randomly throwing that out there for whatever reason. You know, is that an excuse to kind of toss the tech, or, or, or if ramps aren't working for you, you know, maybe find a different way to do it. I'm just, I'm just kind of throwing that, you know, throwing that out there, right? Like, if someone gave you the car of your dreams, I, I think about it this way: if someone gave you the car of your dreams, like they just maybe you don't have a car of your dreams, but if you had the car of your dreams, right? Like I always wanted that car, and someone just gave it to you, but they told you. The reverse doesn't work. You can have it for free, but reverse does not work. Well, would you take it? Probably. You just, you know, <laughs> find ways to push it if you need it to move in reverse or don't park it in your, you know, in your driveway or whatever, right? So, so uh, you know, that's the kind of way I think about it. Uh, so, you know, nothing's perfect, but, uh, you know, anyway. Okay, <laughs> cool. We're good. All right. Uh, all right. So, um, uh, good comments. Okay, so these are these are the ways you can do it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna run over some more for instances. Adapt and push it. There you go. Adapt and push it. You know we should have an icon. Push the software, right? <laughs> push your dream car in reverse, right? Use reverse doesn't work. Uh, I love it. Uh, okay. So um, uh, let's see here. Okay. So so what I do is uh, uh, I like to do one page summaries. So what I just explained is this one page summary here of uh, of, of what we just went over, right? And, and you know, I, I encourage you, uh, you know, if you, if you need to kind of sell this tech or you need to explain this to people in your office uh, to get more on board with this, you know, I recommend doing simple examples like this uh, and then, um, you know, showing them uh, because it's easier for people to digest small things. Like this is just uh, two, four, this is just six components that makes the topography go to go to Revit, right? So this is just a summary of what we talked about. But let's let's go ahead and talk about other scenarios, right? What about the ramp here? Or what about the uh, what about the floor, right? Let's talk about the floor, right? If you had to get this floor element from Rhino into Revit, right? How would you how would you do it? I mean, 
this is basically a, a, a solid in Revit. They're actually polysurfaces, but I mean, polysurfaces in rhinoceros. How would you get this into Revit? What, what do you think it would be? I mean, this is parking, let's just say, right? What, what would it be in, in Revit, right? Like you have to ask yourself these questions and there's no wrong answer. Maybe it's a building pad. Maybe it's a floor element. Maybe it's a direct a shape import with, you know, with a certain material applied to it in a certain category. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's, you're living life on the edge and it's, it's a roof element, right? So um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because as you use this tech, you don't just push a button and then everything magically converts, right? I don't select this whole thing and say, go, go to Revit, right? Because, because, because Rhino sa Revit says, okay, what are you? What category are you? What category are you? What type are you? What material are you, right? You're going, from a, you're going from a 3D modeling software into a BIM software. And so each element needs to be assigned to something because that's the whole point of BIM, right? They have, they have meaning behind it. They have information behind it. So you have to supply that. You have to tell it that. So this one, I, I mean, probably for simplicity would probably be a floor, I guess. Someone said a pad. I'm, I'm going to live life on the edge and build it as a floor in Revit, okay? Uh, that's how I'm going to do it. But, you know, you, you may have your other ways. I'm not pushing you in any direction. But if you were going to do that, this is how you would do it. It's just a few extra nodes. You basically grab the surface. You, you, grab, you grab the solid using Grasshopper from, from Rhinoceros. You basically grab one of the bottom surfaces. You extract the boundaries. And then you use this very special node called Add Floor. Okay, and this will add it, add it to it. Okay, so let's keep moving a little bit further because I'm, I'm kind of slowing down here. But, but, um, but anyway, you can, you can bring in meaning information like for structural columns. In this case, I'll, I'll point this out. Uh, do you remember those structural columns that were sitting way up there up on the hill um, for all you structural uh, experts? Like these, these columns right here, these are just solids inside of Revit, but these actually have some information. If you don't know, there's something called user attributes uh, that you can assign in Rhinoceros uh, to these elements, right? They're just called key value pairs. You just basically can type information in there. But that information could be carried it over into Revit in a meaningful way. So in this case, um, what I did was, uh, um, you know, if you talk with your Revit user or if you're the Revit user and you want to get it over and you knew it's a certain size column, you can embed that information and then you can bring that information uh, over uh, to, uh, to Revit. Where's Revit? To Revit. Oh, no, I'm going back to my slideshow. And then, um, and basically you can use some add-ins called Elephant. And basically through, through, these, through the information you embed in Rhinoceros, you can basically build the, the, the column in Revit, but also assign it a type because that information can be embedded there. So it's really very, very powerful. It carries metadata, big question mark. Absolutely, it carries metadata. Yes, carry, very good. And that's a whole nother area that I think a lot of people haven't explored yet is that you can embed metadata inside of Rhinoceros. Rhinoceros not only carries geometry, but it can also carry metadata. Yes, it can carry text. It calls in the forms of uh, key value pairs. Okay. Uh, and then, um, of course, uh, I won't, you know, I can, go, I can go on and on for hours about all this, but um, uh, this new tech, but um, you can also go the other way. You can go from Revit to Rhinoceros. Now, why would you want to do that? Maybe um, some simple cases would be, like, I like the way uh, I can model stairs in Revit a lot easier than I can model stairs in, in Rhinoceros. So maybe I'm working with Rhinoceros and a designer and they need, I need some stairs in there. Maybe I build them in Revit and then bring them over to Rhinoceros. It's just a few simple grasshopper nodes. Or um, you see here, I brought the, the, the Rhinoceros that's in Revit. <laughs> I brought it into Rhino. Um, I call him Billy because I call Rhino and Revit, Revit and Rhino and you know, it's, it's confusing, but this is Billy the Revit Rhino, I brought him into Rhino. So this is Billy in Rhino. And look, this converted pretty well. So that's it. It's just two nodes, boom, boom. Okay, so you can bring geometry over. Another way is maybe you're building, doing all your documentation in Revit, and now you want to get it to fabrication. So you want to bring it back over to Rhinoceros so that you can send it to CNC machines and do all your cutting or whatever with your with your elements or whatever. Uh, that's, that's another reason to go the other way, to go from, from from Revit to Rhinoceros. So there's a lot of reasons why you might want to do that, but it's totally valid. Okay, now, what does this have to do with Dynamo? Um, 
it has a lot to do with dynamo okay so let's see also simulations ladybug sure sure very good miliano yes ladybug so it's bi-directional it is absolutely bi-directional yes 100 bi-directional very good carrie for bringing that up thank you okay so um uh where are we uh give me about maybe about in about seven more minutes and then we'll we'll hit our q a we doing okay on time jasper yeah yeah okay what about dynamo what about dynamo okay dynamo has been around dynamo okay so grasshopper has only been touching the revit database for about a year and a half now ever since the rhino inside revit tech has been out so um did you see when i showed you the rhino of uh, the grasshopper um inside of um inside of uh red inside of revit this is right this is grasshopper inside of revit over here there's a revit tab uh there's a bunch of revit components in here that talk with the revit database but there's uh there's about 206 or a little over 200 okay that's not a whole lot because rhino inside revit is so new okay so what i encourage you to do is is if you if you if if you have dynamo in your office and you're working with dynamo in your office then then think about it this way um, maybe you have already pre custom scripts things you're using for dynamo player continue to use dynamo dynamo has been around eight years or more talking with revit it's experienced between out of the box dynamo nodes and 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 the packages out there there's thousands of dynamo nodes that are out there versus the 206 of the of the grasshopper ones now of course those are increasing all the time but the point is is that you can use dynamo and grasshopper at the same time to help you uh and i i won't go into a whole lot of examples here but um but basically basically i got plenty of examples to go over but basically you can think about it this way um, you can use Rhino and Grasshopper to bring your geometry in. And then when your geometry is in Revit at the same time, you can have them open at the same time. You can have Dynamo working with Revit. So maybe a scenario is, uh, actually I had this last one here. Maybe Rhino is building your walls and you're bringing your walls into Revit, okay? And then, and then Dynamo is assigning the rooms because right now Grasshopper doesn't have a component to build rooms in Revit. But Dynamo does. So you can use Dynamo to place your rooms. You can use Grasshopper and Rhino to bring in your geometry. So one more time, I think I'm confusing everybody. One more time is you can use Rhino and Grasshopper to bring your geometry into Revit. You can use Dynamo to do the things that that is maybe non-geometry related, like adding rooms, uh, changing sheet names, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, just something to think about. Um, can someone give me like a thumbs up if you kind of understood what I just said? Because I'm worried I'm kind of losing you and I'm moving, moving a little too fast. Does everyone understand this? This is not conventional, um, but this is this is not promoted. You can't Google this and find this, but I personally use this method all the time. And what I'm trying to say is you don't need to scrap Dynamo. It is very much a part of your life. Okay, Carrie, yes, it's a mixed application. And why can't it be mixed? Of course it mixed. I mean, why not? Why not have Dynamo and Grasshopper open at the same time? Why not both working on Revit at the same time? Why not? So what? Think about it that way. Uh, okay, one more thing I want everyone to understand and think about is, you know, I, I always talk about the software, the software, the software, the software. Well, if you have, if you have a company where you're using individuals to do this, meaning you have, uh, use a bit of that appropriate in your purpose. Yes, of course. Um, you have a dedicated design team that's doing the design modeling in Rhino or I mean, in sorry, in SketchUp or or Rhinoceros or 3ds Max, um, and then you have another team that's doing the 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 documentation and the and the Revit modeling. Does anyone have that in their office where you have two either individuals or individual groups, one that does the design and the 3D modeling for the design? like in Rhinoceros, SketchUp, 3ds Max, and then you have another group that does the Revit uh, documentation and the Dynamo usage. Does anyone want to chime in on that? Is, is that? is that true for anyone here in their office? 
You can concentrate two scripts to Grasshopper than Dynamo to run automatically. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, oh, it's a question. Okay, but um, did anyone get that question? Think about that. Does anybody have multiple individuals? One group or individuals that does the design and does the 3D modeling and the design software. Another group that does the Revit documentation and Dynamo usage. Give me a plus if anyone is in that scenario in their office. Okay, that would be awesome if you can give me feedback on that. And I'll ask this question. Armadio said, uh, can you? Yes, master planning. Okay, uh, Jane, thank you. Can you concentrate, can you concatenate the two scripts, Grasshopper first and Dynamo to run automatically? Or do you need to run manually the second when the first completes? Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a very good question. The question was, can you run Rhino and Grasshopper and Dynamo kind of at the same time or are they separate kind of clicks to run or can you program them for one to run over the other um well technically you can do all you can do all of them um the only the only way i've ever used it was i run grasshopper and then i run dynamo but you certainly could be savvy enough to program it that way because they all share the same resources which is revit so they're all sharing the resources so you could know kind of what each one's doing, although that would require more complicated programming. And that's, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, that's how it could work, but I'm not the expert in that area, but I think it is possible. Yeah, we can get the McNeil folks and maybe the Autodesk folks to help kind of answer that question. Um, but a good question. That's totally an in the weed question. And then I'm getting yeses on the, on the yes, there are two groups. Okay, my point is, is that, these softwares are great, you know, but the only way this is, the only way this process is ever going to be successful, where you use Rhino and Revit and you're going from Rhino to Revit, is if you get the individuals involved to talk and be friendly. Now, this is what makes it possible. You have Rhino users, you have Revit users. They need to talk and work together because you could have the best plan in the world, the software can talk, but if you don't have the individuals working together, then your whole thing collapses. So this is kind of my last little segment, uh, third act in this thing. Dine document is a typical approach in large practices, but smaller offices do a lot. Okay, yeah, so so uh, maybe in the big firms, they're, they're individuals. In larger firms, they're individual groups. In, in small firms or one person firms, it's only the one individual doing it. Okay, that, I get it. Um, Another thing to think about, even if you're a one person shop and you're just doing all of it, you still need, sometimes need to communicate with like subs, right? Or, or design consultants. And those may be other individuals that you need to work with. You have a Rhino model, you have a Revit model, but you need to give the Rhino model to your consultant so they can use it. So I think, I think there's always gonna need to be two entities involved here. Not always, you know, even if you're in the, you get what I'm saying, okay. Uh, so, so, so the point here is that you need individuals to work together or this won't work. It totally breaks down. And I have seen firms not work it out because technically they have the tech, they have a plan, but they don't have the two groups working together, which is so important. Uh, and, and you sometimes you find that those groups don't like to work together. Uh, and so you, you got to kind of get over that hurdle. And I like to bring them together. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm, I used to run a comic strip and, you know, I, I don't have time to go into all this, but, but basically the bottom line is that you need, you need them to work together. Like, so for example, if you're going to get your Rhino geometry into Revit, you need to talk to the Revit user. And even if it's you, you need to plan ahead. How am I going to model this in Rhinoceros? So it makes it for an easy transition into Revit. And then Revit needs to think, how is this modeled inside of Rhinoceros so I know how to document it? Maybe let's start putting it on certain layers now in Rhinoceros to make our lives easier down the road. So I think my whole point is, is that you need to have a proactive approach to this. And the only way to have a proactive approach to this is that if the individuals are talking and working it out. A design project workflow across the project, across office politics. Uh, design a project workflow across the project. Carrie office politics. Office politics certainly do get in the way. I think this goes way back to what we were talking about, about having a whole buy-in to the company on this is extremely important. Um, getting everyone together is extremely important. So I like to try to do my little part 
So what I did was to help get Grasshopper and Dynamo users working together. Uh, um, I think Jasper and um, Mario mentioned this in the beginning uh, that uh, I have written a book, uh, basically side-by-side -side comparisons. This is how you do it in Dynamo. This is how you do it in Grasshopper. Um, you know, there's a bunch of examples there. So this is the book I wrote. You can, if you want to check it out, um, go ahead. Uh, and uh, basically it's just uh, one side says, this is how you do it in Dynamo. This is how you do it in Grasshopper. And the idea was there was if you, if you know Dynamo and you want to learn Grasshopper, then it's an easy transition. If you know Grasshopper and you want to know Dynamo, then it's an easy transition to see how they do equivalent uh, side by side, or you can just use it as a reference manual. So that's, that's kind of the idea there. Uh, okay, so uh, how do we do on time? An hour and 15 minutes, not too bad. Uh, all right, so uh, again, thank you, everybody. I'll stick around. Got the book, very useful and much recommended. Okay, Carrie, thank you for the support. Here it is. Uh, here's the book. Again, you can, uh, you can look at it. Uh, it's got uh, four parts in it. Uh, it's got a geometry section, a, a, a specific section to Revit. Uh, and then you got the side-by-side -side comparisons. You've got on the left, you have green. On the right, you have red. The left is Grasshopper, the right is, is Dynamo. There's, uh, there's almost, uh, let's see, there's almost um, 300 pages in here, four separate sections. Uh, a whole nother one is just on, on uh, customizing Dynamo, uh, programming C-sharp, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then the last section is on interoperability, how to get uh, from one to the other. Uh, so um, this is not a plug, a shame, a, this is not a shameless plug for the book, but, but this helps kind of tie a lot of the stuff I'm talking about together. Um, so if you, if you have questions or you want to, you want to get the book or go to the website, check it out. Uh, and this is, you know, super, super cutting and stuff. Uh, we'll plug this on my YouTube channel. Okay, Richard. Very good. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, Jasper, Mario, I'm, uh, I, I'm going to say that's the formal conclusion of my presentation. Um, I had a lot of awesome feedback. I'll stick around if anyone has any, any questions. Um, I would love to, uh, I'd love to answer them. You can trick Dynamo. Let's see, uh, we've got another question. You can trick Dynamo. I place an instance category, otherwise don't use for Dynamo to pick up input toggle. Okay, good. So, so you're kind of, you're kind of using hybrid versions. That's awesome. I love it. Um, okay. All right. So uh, are the organizers there? If you, uh, You'd like to chime yes, in we are. Okay, excellent. <laughs> yes, we are. So I'm I'm here. If you if you want to ask questions or the audience wants to ask questions, I'll stick around maybe another 15 minutes, and I'd be happy to answer questions. I'm very happy. This is a really nice, lively group. Uh, this was so much fun. Um, yeah, stick around for question time if you want to. Be happy to answer any question you want. Uh, so uh, first of all, I just want to thank you, Marcello, for your presentation. Um, very, yeah. I mean. Uh, Fantastic. And I think that the most important takeaway is, uh, or let's say what I think is the most important takeaway is that is never about, or not only about using a software, is about a workflow, is about a, a research and development approach, is about uh, finding out of the box solutions. And through this approach, you know, uh, doing something that like, like you did in your across your career that uh, do something that uh, has never been done before, you know, uh, also your, your experience in, in, in the projects, in the uh, Gary's projects, I think uh, demonstrates uh, that. Um, so, and um, again, I, I think that uh, one of the best uh, also lesson here is how to uh, adapt and how to compare to different uh, solutions, to different platforms, uh, Rhino and Grasshopper and Revit and Dynamo in a very um, open-minded and uh, you know, way, not, uh, not precluding one to the other and uh, trying to collaborate and take the best of the two platforms. Uh, and I think that the last piece of your presentation was also about this, not to be too, you know, too fond on uh, a particular platform or a particular process. So be ready to, to, to experiment and be open. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. The, that's, that's this presentation in a nutshell. That's your takeaways. <laughs> Very good. Yep. This could have been 10 minutes long, this presentation that with a summary like that. 
Good job. I did. I did want to. I didn't want to simplify, but uh, your presentation is yeah really, uh, you know, uh, um, somehow goes into the, the 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 details and the the shades of this of this approach. But I think that this is what what I what I appreciated uh, the most because especially for people like myself or others who has to uh, manage you know uh, groups and teams and uh, also upskill you know uh, teams in the organization so uh, it's really a, um, a very good uh, approach and i yeah I totally support it uh, do um, jasper do we have any questions uh, left in the in the chat yeah there's one more um, by joel he's asking when you use the graph to create a topo and use the graph in a different time he will adapt uh, the existing topo or create a new one. I guess what he's asking is if you were to create a graph and run the topo and, and run create a topo right now, if you close the software and everything and then reuse it, let's say the next day, um, will it adapt to the existing topo or create a new one? Very good question. Okay, thank you, Jasper and Joel. Oh, and uh, yes, you're welcome. I saw Robin's comment there staying up late. You're very welcome. Um, no problem. I feel like an honorary uh, 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 New Zealand uh, Dynamo user group member, so I, I appreciate it. You uh, definitely are. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good question. You're getting at, I love these questions. Okay. What you're getting at is you're asking if, I'll use my hand waving, if, uh, and let's uh, maybe I'll, I don't need to share my screen. Okay. So, um, if you have the topo element in rhinoceros, which was a, a brep, a surface, and then you use grasshopper as the conduit to rebuild, to build a, a topo surface in Revit that's controlled by geometry in rhinoceros. If you modify rhinoceros, or if you were to close everything down, as Jasper said, open it the next day, make a modification, would the topo surface in Revit be modified or would it build a new topo surface over the old one is the question, right? Okay, and that's a good question. And that is a valid question and something that you should always be kind of thinking about because if, and that's the scenario, if that was the scenario and it did build another one instead of modify, if you were to tag it, dimension to it, and then all of a sudden, uh, you made a change, then none of that tag or smart information or anything that's hosted to it would carry over to your quote unquote new surface. Okay, you hit on something called element binding, which means Rhino inside Revit as well as Dynamo now use a concept called element binding, which means that if you build something in Revit using Rhino inside Revit. Rhino inside Revit is now smart enough to know that it built that element in Revit. And if it's smart enough to know that it built it in Revit, then when you make modifications, it is smart enough to know that you don't want to build a new one. You just want that one modified. So it will be modified with the same element ID number. Um, and so all of your tagging and dimensioning and everything you host to it would also remain. Now, element binding is still being worked on in Rhino inside Revit. So it doesn't occur for every single element that you could create, but it certainly exists for a lot of them. Topo is one of them, floors, beams, columns, like kind of the main candidates. Um, uh, you know, Cause it's like it's in beta, it's not everything yet, um, but, but it's certainly, it certainly on the main ones is already there. Does that help answer your question? So it updates an element level rather than a file level. It updates the element level rather than the file level. I suppose that's the way to look at it. It doesn't change the ID number. So to the user, it's the same thing. So all your tags and, and dimensioning all gets preserved. I think that's kind of the heart of the question and a very good question. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What yep. else there is another one in the Q&A. Um, that's Emmanuel asking, what is the uptake of Rhino inside Revit on large firms in the US? 
if you have the data, if you know that is. I'm not, I, I'm not, I, <laughs> I can only speak to the large firms and we're talking design firms, right? I can only speak to the large design firms that I've spoke with. Um, all of them have tried it in one form or another. Yeah. What I, what I find is that even if there's a dot, even if there's a trial and quote unquote adoption to some extent, I have not really seen full scale firm adoption like you would see with BIM. Uh, there are some firms out there I have seen those, but but on, on the whole, I haven't seen that. So um, so I guess my answer is um, um, I've seen a lot of firms use it, large firms use it and experiment with it. I don't know that that question's all over the place. I'm sorry, I'm going to get myself in trouble, uh, uh, but with that, but I, I I don't really have a good answer for that. Other than other than I guess I other than I guess I can say. Of the large architecture firms I have talked to, every single one of them have at least experimented with it. Okay, there, I'm safe saying that. <laughs> Not that that's, that's good. Uh, I suppose we, we'll put a call out to uh, last questions uh, from all the, any of the attendees. Well, okay. I think um, Matt, it might be in one of the Zoom meeting, uh, Zoom webinar, but you've got a question as well. No, no more questions from our side, Jasper. Okay, what do we got? We got a link here. What is this? We got a link, which is from flushes data through an element level rather than a model level. Flushes data. Okay, Carrie's getting in the weeds there. <laughs> but okay, yeah, you know, if uh, I think it's great, you know, anyone who wants to share some of their work that you've been working on uh, on Rhino Inside Revit, I think that's great. You know, you could pass that on to your awesome uh, um, leadership team here, and they could probably find ways to highlight it. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think this is all good about sharing. I see uh, this website's kind of, uh, yeah, I think this goes back to what Amato was saying about, you know, always keeping an open mind about, about the latest tools. We could feature it on the upcoming events. Sure, yeah, yeah. Have fun with it, you know? Like, it's really fun to, 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 to highlight what you're doing and you should be proud of it. If you're using the latest, if you're using this tech and you're, it's making your life better in your office, you should, you should show it off and, and be proud of it, yeah. And I know so, with those questions that we've been getting, I know there's a lot of individuals here who've already been trying this new technology, um, which is awesome. And also are in the right frame of mind. Uh, on, right, that's the big thing too. So that is that is awesome. Right, well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank okay. you for the presentation. Okay, thank you. I'm conscious about the time, and uh, again, thank you, Marcello, very very much for your presentation and to uh, contribute to our uh, small group that is growing up but uh, um, we are yeah we are very happy to 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 um, to host you so i think that we will get in touch with you sooner or later to to talk about possibly generative design or other topics um, i close this uh, meeting if there's a there's no other questions. I don't see any anything coming. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Again, the uh, recording will be available uh, on our um, YouTube channel. So stay in touch.